picturesque Ryukyu Islands are adorned with stories buried deep within their every corner and stories etched in the sands of time. Along the serene and azure coastline, the sands are gently caressed by the sea breeze, as if resonating with the bygone eras of centuries past. Yet, beneath the breathtaking beauty of this landscape lies a forgotten history laden with sorrow. In the middle to late 6th century, Emperor Yan of the Sui dynasty dispatched the captain of the feathered cavalry, Zhu Quan, on a voyage of exploration to distant lands. Zhu Quan reached the northern part of what is now Amami Oshima and the island of Yanaguni. There, he witnessed a cluster of islands resembling pearls, spiraling and winding amid the tumultuous waves like a coiling dragon on the water's surface. He christened this mysterious place Liuqiu. Due to the language barrier, one local inhabitant was captured and brought back to the central plains. The following year, in the fourth year of the Sui de Yuan era, Emperor Yang sent Zhu Quan again to pacify the region. At the time, the people of Ryukyu often came to the Chinese military camps as traders, indicating that the exchange between central China and Ryukyu predated the official historical records. However, the exact time frame has become lost in history. Nevertheless, the people of Ryukyu were unwilling to accept the pacification efforts, prompting Emperor Yang to command Wu Ben Zhongwang General Chen Emo, Grand Counselor Zhang Jinzhou, and others to lead an army to subdue Ryukyu. Among the troops was a Kunlun man proficient in the Ryukyuan language who was entrusted with the task of reconciliation. However, the people of Ryukyu remained obstinate, leading to a Sui military campaign that resulted in the capture of the city of Shuri, the destruction of its fortifications, and the capture of over a thousand men and women, who were brought back to the central plains. In the compilation of the Sui history during the Tang dynasty, the region's name was changed from Liuqiu to Liuqiu due to the potential conflict with the imperial dragon title, as Chiu signifies a small dragon. It was not until the fifth year of the Hanwu era in the Ming Dynasty, 1372, that the name Ryukyu was officially recorded, signifying its preciousness akin to lapis lazuli and pearls. This name endures to this day. Ryukyu's history unfolds in a tapestry woven with exploration, adventure, exchange, and conquest, revealing its magical chapters through the ages. During the Qiandao era of the Southern Song Dynasty, Yuan, known as Jinshi Balaro, was in exile on the distant Ryukyu Islands, which had not yet established formal relations with China. While there, he fathered a son named Zundin, who would later become known as Shunten and eventually serve as the magistrate of Puji in his youth. Tianzun Dynasty's 25th king, having fallen under the influence of a powerful minister named Li Yong, was assassinated, plunging Ryukyu into chaos. Shunten led forces to quell the rebellion and vanquished Li Yong. With the last king of the Tianzun Dynasty leaving no heirs, the 22 year old Shunten was subsequently chosen as king by his ministers the following year. After the fall of the Southern Song Dynasty, during the reign of the Yuan Dynasty's Emperor Shizu, the name Liuqiu was changed to Liuqiu, the difference of a single Chinese character. An expedition was launched, capturing more than 130 individuals and returning to the Central Plains. This marked the Central Chinese Dynasty's second and final military campaign against Ryukyu. However, it is essential to note that neither the Sui dynasty nor the Yuan dynasty intended to annex Ryukyu. The central Chinese dynasties aimed to incorporate Ryukyu into their tributary system. This goal would ultimately be realized during the Ming dynasty. By the end of the Yuan dynasty, Ryukyu had been divided into three states, San Nan, Chuzhen, and San Boku. Among these, the Chusun state stood out with its considerable power. In 1372, Emperor Han Wu of the Ming Dynasty issued summoning orders to the three states, with envoys from the Chusun state being the first to offer tribute to the Ming court. Once the tributary relationship between Ryukyu and China was established, Emperor Taizu of the Ming Dynasty, 
in the eighth year of his reign, ordered the offering of sacrifices to the mountains and rivers of Ryukyu in Fujian province. Upon learning of Chusun's tributary status, the kings of Sannan and Sanboku also offered tribute to the Ming dynasty in 1380 and 1383, officially becoming vassals of the Ming dynasty. They vied for recognition and support from the Ming dynasty. Due to the continuous disputes among the three states, each claiming to be the legitimate successor to the Ming dynasty's tribute system, Emperor Taizu, in the 16th year of his reign, dispatched envoys Liang Man and Lu Qianxiao to deliver an imperial edict, ordering the three states to cease hostilities and lay down their arms. They complied with the imperial decree and temporarily halted hostilities. It was not until 1429 that King Shangbatsi of Chuzin defeated King Terahai of Sannan and unified the three states, establishing the Ryukyu kingdom with its capital and Shuri castle. King Shangbatsi was officially conferred the title of the Ryukyu king by the Ming government. In the fifth year of the Ming Shuanda era, in 1430, Emperor Xuanzong decided to bestow upon the Ryukyu king a unique Shang surname. This conferred surname carried profound implications, as in ancient China, the character Shang signified the responsibility of managing imperial affairs. Emperor Xuanzong's act of granting this surname was well considered and significant. From that point onward, during the Ming and Qing dynasties, successive kings of Ryukyu were required to accept China's inauguration to ascend the throne legitimately. Otherwise, they could only be called crown princes, temporarily responsible for governing the country. This investiture system remained unbroken from Sado to the last king, Shou Tai. The political legitimacy of Ryukyu's kings hinged on recognition from the central Chinese dynasty. Even usurpers like Kinmaru had to impersonate themselves as the legitimate king's sons, taking on the name Shou En and requesting investiture from the imperial court. In 1472, during the reign of Emperor Xianzong of the Ming Dynasty, Shou En was officially invested as the King of Ryukyu, marking the beginning of the Second Shou Dynasty in Ryukyu. However, the relationship between China and Ryukyu extended beyond political investiture. Since 1392, during the 25th year of the Hangu era of the Ming Dynasty, Emperor Taizu allowed members of the Ryukyuan royal family and the offspring of high-ranking officials to come to the Imperial Academy to study. Concurrently, recognizing the challenges faced by Ryukyuan envoys during their sea voyages to China, the Ming dynasty specially granted immigration to the 36 clans of Min people to settle in Ryukyu. These Min people were experts in shipbuilding and navigation. They served not only as skilled seafarers but also played crucial roles as interpreters and in other matters related to tribute missions. This move aimed to promote the values of the suzerain state, propagate Chinese cultural ideas like Confucianism, and foster the growth of Chinese cultural influence in the vassal state. Among the 36 clans sent to Ryukyu, the majority of them were of Fujianese descent, including surnames like Sheng, Yang, Lin, Liang, Cheng, and Jin, while others were of Chuanzhou descent, primarily the Kai surname and Zhangzhou descent, mainly the Ruan and Mao surnames. However, over time, the influence of the 36 clans in Ryukyu did not grow stronger but somewhat waned. By the end of the Wanli era, during the late Ming dynasty, many of the 36 clans had either disappeared or changed their surnames, with only a few surviving. Relying on the descendants of these early Ming immigrants to serve as officials or interpreters in Ryukyu became increasingly unlikely. In 1607, during the 35th year of the Wanli era, King Shou Enyi petitioned the Ming court to follow the precedent of the Hangu era and allocate the 36 clans back to Ryukyu, reinstating their duties. However, this request was politely declined by the Ministry of Rights. Consequently, 
as they could not obtain the opportunity for fresh waves of Chinese immigrants to Ryukyu. The influence of the 36 clans from the early Ming dynasty gradually diminished without new blood from mainland China. The downfall of the Ming dynasty and the termination of the Ming Ryukyu tribute relationship plunged Ryukyu into a state of uncertainty. It provided Ryukyu with multiple options for handling its foreign relations. However, ultimately, Ryukyu chose to establish a suzerain tributary relationship with the Qing dynasty, becoming a part of the East Asian tributary system centered around the Qing dynasty. The establishment of the Qing Ryukyu tribute relationship was accompanied by mutual struggles and negotiations among various power groups during the transition from the Ming to the Qing dynasty. During this process, Ryukyu opted for the Qing dynasty as it was the most powerful entity capable of ensuring Ryukyu's national security and economic interests. This choice allowed Ryukyu to maintain its sovereignty and facilitate economic and social development within the Qing dynasty's suzerainty system. The decision was primarily driven by realpolitik considerations including the historical accumulation of centuries of Sino-Ryukyuan tribute relations and the associated sense of identity, the pragmatic economic interests of maritime merchant groups dominating Ryukyu's trade activities, as well as Ryukyu's national character marked by submission and humility. Establishing the Qing-Ryukyu tribute relationship allowed Ryukyu to return to its previous position during a complex and changing period in East Asian maritime power dynamics. It helped Ryukyu find stability in its political and economic environment, maintain the development of its overseas trade, and ensure its continued existence as an independent nation, lasting until its ultimate demise 230 years later. From the second year of the Ming Yongle era, 1404, to the fifth year of the Qing Tongji era, 1866, spanning over four centuries, Ryukyu was profoundly influenced by Chinese culture, and its official language became Chinese. After the 36 Men clans arrived in Ryukyu, they received immense respect from all levels of Ryukyuan society, from the royal court to the ordinary people. The Ryukyuan kings not only bestowed surnames upon their ministers, adopting Chinese names themselves, but they also expanded this practice, starting with the nobility and extending to the ordinary people. They ordered the major noble clans to compile genealogies so that every Ryukyuan family could trace its lineage, know its rank, and understand its seniority. This practice helped the Ryukyuan people honor their ancestors. Over time, it contributed to the development of Ryukyu as a nation that valued etiquette and ceremony. The 36 men clans in Ryukyu primarily handled maritime affairs, shipbuilding, the composition of diplomatic documents, translation, and trade with China. Their descendants were dominant in linguistic abilities and Confucian learning in Ryukyu. They were entrusted with significant responsibilities participating in crucial political, economic, and cultural activities. For generations, they enjoyed high-ranking positions and substantial rewards, with some even rising to the rank of prime minister, such as the renowned statesman Kaiwan. Kim Village, meaning eternal enjoyment of a stipend, became a center for spreading Chinese culture and advanced production techniques to Ryukyu. Fuzhou plays a significant role in the interaction between China and Ryukyu as the only port open to Ryukyu in China. Various elements of Chinese folk culture, examples of these elements include the Tomb Sweeping Festival, Tortoise Shell Tombs, and the Stone of the Most Revered on Mount Tai, all of which were brought over with the 36 surnames by the Fujianese. Remain astonishingly similar to those in Fujian to this day despite undergoing centuries of cultivation. The Ryukyuan people first came into contact with Fujian and then got to know China through this contact. Since the arrival of the Fujianese with the 36 surnames in Ryukyu at the beginning of the Ming Dynasty, it has become an established rite for the Fujianese to pay homage to their ancestors at the Tomb Sweeping Festival. To this day, 
tens of thousands of Ryukyuan people collectively sweep tombs on the two Sundays before and after April 5th of the Gregorian calendar, on a scale that parallels the practice in China. Apart from the tomb sweeping festival, customs such as the Dragon Boat Festival on May 5th, the Rice Festival in June, and ancestor worship at the Hungry Ghost Festival on July 15th all bear notable similarities to the customs in Guangdong, Guangxi, and Fujian. The Ryukyuan graves, known as tortoiseshell tombs, are constructed with three stone sides, their curved forms reminiscent of a tortoise's shell. These tortoiseshell tombs, commonplace in the Minan region of China, symbolize the close ties between Ryukyu and southern China. The belief in the stone of the most revered on Mount Tai, once famous in Chinese folklore, still pervades northern Fujian's rural areas, where the stone is typically placed in front of houses facing busy crossroads to suppress evil spirits. The belief in the stone was introduced to Japan and Ryukyu in the 14th and 15th centuries and is often found at T-junctions in Ryukyu to ward off evil spirits. During the Ming and Qing dynasties, the pinnacle of Chinese architectural culture, southern China's distinctive architectural features significantly influenced Ryukyu. Ryukyuan architectural landmarks, such as Shuri Castle, Fuzhou Garden, and Stone Lions, all retain traces of Fujian architecture. Situated east of Naha City in Okinawa County, Shuri Castle was once the capital of the Ryukyu Kingdom. Not only did it adopt the traditional Fujian architectural technique of using bricks on the outside and stones on the inside for its walls, but some of its stones were also directly transported from Fujian. These relics of Fujian architecture can be spotted all around Ryukyu down to today's age, indicating just how much the Ryukyuan kingdom revered and admired the culture of China. In the history of Ryukyu, not only was Kyum Island, where Fujianese Chinese resided, referred to as Tang Camp, but also their martial arts techniques brought over from China were dubbed Tang Hands. These techniques were later passed on to the central island of Japan and directly influenced the birth of karate in Japan. Many Kyum people, apart from having Japanese names, some of them who have a strong emotional attachment to China, still use Chinese names for their children, despite government disapproval, as a remembrance of their Chinese ancestry. Even today, Kyum Village in Ryukyu is still considered the most concentrated community of Chinese culture, where Confucius rites are held annually. Despite several changes across hundreds of years, the culture of Ryukyu has preserved many elements of Chinese culture, particularly of South China, in various aspects such as folk customs, architecture, and language. Every one of these cultural relics stands as the best witness to the cultural exchange between China and Ryukyu. The Ryukyu Kingdom has always been an independent trading nation. Its strategic location made it a trading hub between China, Japan, and Southeast Asia. The force transforming Ryukyu into a trading kingdom came from China rather than Japan. During the Ming and Qing dynasties, the trade activities between China and Ryukyu included official tribute and private trade. Considering the forms, the official tribute trade could be further divided into enfiefment and tribute trade. Considering its nature, it could be divided into official and private trade. Private trade could be legal or illegal. The Ming government's trade with Ryukyu was a typical official tribute trade developed in China since the Han Dynasty, based on the ideology of China's economic superiority. In tribute trade, all delegates received large quantities of gold and silver, porcelain and silk. In addition to the representatives who came to the capital for tribute, many Ryukyu followers stayed in Fujian Ryukyu House. Because the Ming government mainly controlled trade between China and Ryukyu for political appeasement, grand and extravagant gifts were given in return. Precious shipments were sent to specific countries in East Asia and Southeast Asia to be sold or distributed to political allies. The tribute trade was an official commercial tactic within internation interaction at an official level. 
However, the Ming and Qing dynasties' marine conservatory but variable policies resulted in the sea ban, prohibiting private overseas trade to monopolize foreign exchange through tribute trade and simultaneously geared towards consolidating the rule and maintaining social stability. Despite the prohibition of private maritime trade with the strict regulation of tribute schedules for vassal states, Ryukyu rapidly took advantage of trade opportunities in Southeast Asia with the excuse of being a small and weak country without ships for tribute, then with the assistance of conferring nationality, crafts, and preferential tribute period from China, building trade bridges with Southeast Asian countries and eventually becoming a thoroughfare to all nations. Ryukyu was often able to exchange tributes and local products for generous rewards. Besides the tributes, the remaining extra goods brought by Ryukyu were also allowed to be sold at the post house. After completing their tribute mission in Beijing, the Ryukyu envoys would return to their country by sea from Fuzhou. The goods carried on the return ship included items rewarded by the court and a large amount of porcelain and silk items secretly purchased by the mission members in Fujian and Zhujiang. The money from selling local products and the Chinese goods they transported became the basis for Ryukyu to conduct trade with Southeast Asian countries. The trade interaction between Ryukyu and Southeast Asia has many prerequisites, mainly dependent on the state of the Ming government's maritime policy. Under the circumstances where severe marine bans were imposed, Chinese merchants were declining. Various tributary countries wanted to obtain goods from China. Still, they were not allowed due to tribute terms. Ryukyu seized the opportunity of tribute trade quickly started and gradually expanded commodity exchanges with Southeast Asian countries. It initiated its own Age of Great Navigation in 1425. The primary route of trade interaction between Ryukyu and Southeast Asia was to depart from Naha port in August or September each year, with the northeast monsoon reaching Annan, now Vietnam, and Siam, now Thailand, along Fujian and Guangdong. From there, the route was split into two, one continued along the southern part of Siam and traveled southwest via Fatani, the area around today's Padani in Thailand, to Malacca. After quickly completing trade transactions, they returned to Ryukyu through Sumatra, Old Port, today's Jakarta in Indonesia, Java, and other countries with the southwest monsoon in March or April of the following year. The different routes went directly south to Java, completed trade transactions, and returned to Ryukyu along the Luzon-Sulu line. These two routes formed what was known as the Ryukyu Network at that time. During a century and a half of trade interaction between Ryukyu and Southeast Asia, they gradually deepened their understanding of the customs and conditions of Southeast Asian countries through maritime practices. On the one hand, Ryukyu's diplomatic ships were dual use and simultaneously sent to two countries. The King of Anam was mainly decorated with royal decorations, with an additional 20,000 caddies of iron. Siam was mainly equipped with folding fans, porcelain, and other living utensils. On the other hand, the Ryukyu people always observed the local laws and customs of the trading country. Even during the Chenghua period, when an incident of Ryukyu people causing trouble occurred in the trade with Malacca, the king of Ryukyu quickly dealt with the related personnel after the ship returned to the country and made a formal apology in the reciprocal correspondence also expressing if in the future envoys violate norms, we hope to be admonished so that we can still sustain our alliance without any regrets. This self-discipline principle has also become an essential reason for the continued interaction between Ryukyu and Southeast Asian countries. During the mid-late 6th century AD, the sphere of interaction between the Ryukyu Islands and Southeast Asian nations gradually expanded. A stable maritime route was formed, spanning from the Ryukyu Islands to the Malay Peninsula, the Strait of Malacca, Sumatra, Java, the Philippines, and back to the Ryukyu Islands. 
This resulted from a century and a half of Ryukyu's trading practices and was the driving force behind further advancements in maritime trade. However, this kind of transit or intermediary trade, formed under specific conditions, needed to be a more regular form of marketing and unsustainable. It was a trade based on the unequal exchange of tribute trade between the Ming and Ryukyu. The premise of the Ryukyu's interaction with Southeast Asian countries was that it could acquire a large number of Chinese goods famous in the local market. The marine policy of the Ming government greatly influenced this premise. The decline of Ryukyu's transit trade later confirmed this point, i.e., once the sea ban was lifted, the influence of Chinese merchants in Southeast Asia would rise again. The Ryukyu could no longer compete equally with Chinese merchants regarding commodity prices and supply channels. Furthermore, the conquest of Malacca by the Portuguese in 1511 put enormous pressure on Ryukyuan merchant ships heading south. Therefore, the existence of the Ryukyu trade network is an unstable product of a specific period. The interaction between the Ryukyu and Southeast Asia significantly impacted both regions, especially the Ryukyu, which gained its reputation as the bridge of all nations. Unfortunately, the Ryukyu did not see the crisis in its prosperous trade. Under the competitive pressure from Westerners and Chinese merchants, the Ryukyu's previous practice of earning substantial profits through transit trade needed to be updated. The Ryukyu did not invest the earnings from transit trade in learning and improving product technology, such as introducing Chinese porcelain technology and manufacturing porcelain products that reflect local characteristics. The wealth of commerce, entirely controlled by the royal family, was used to build temples and palaces and introduce Buddhist scriptures, revealing a need for more understanding of the dependence and fragility of transit trade. As a result, the country gradually declined in power due to a lack of financial resources. This would later become a significant cause of the Ryukyu Kingdom's dire fate. On June 8, 1582, Kame Karenaga, the owner of Kano Castle from the Anaba Domain, part of modern Tottori Prefecture, saw Hideyoshi Toyotomi on the verge of unifying Japan and requested his lord to grant him the Ryukyu. In response, Hideyoshi Toyotomi gave no clear answer, indicating that the Japanese were already coveting the Ryukyu. In 1587, the Shimizu clan of the Satsuma domain was invaded by Hideyoshi Toyotomi, which led to a power crisis and compelled submission under tremendous pressure. In this context, preventing Kame from becoming the Ryukyu guard became an urgent task for the Shimizu clan. In 1589, the messenger of the Ryukyu King Sho Nei came to Japan's Tenryuji Temple, Peach Hermitage, to see Hideyoshi Toyotomi, ostensibly adopting a submissive attitude towards the Toyotomi clan. In 1592, Hideyoshi Toyotomi issued a red seal to Shimizu Yoshihiro and Shimizu Yashitoshi, making the Ryukyu a subordinate to the Shimizu clan. This subordinate appointment became the basis for Shimizu Yashitoshi's demand in February 1604 for King Sho Nei to acknowledge that the Ryukyu was a vassal of the Satsuma. In the winter of 1602, a Ryukyuan boat drifted to Mutsu Province, now covering the entirety of Aomori, Iwate, Miyagi, and Fukushima prefectures and part of Akita Prefecture in Japan. The following spring, Tokugawa Ayasu ordered his subordinates to return the crew members to Ryukyu but used this as an excuse to request Ryukyu to dispatch a thank you mission to Japan. This move was seen as an offense to the Ming Dynasty central government, as it clearly intended to prompt Ryukyu to help Japan negotiate with the Ming government, first requiring Ryukyu to submit to Japan. In 1609, after receiving permission from the Tokugawa shogunate, Shimizu Hisayoshi brazenly invaded Ryukyu. A descendant of the Jing family, one of the Fujin's 36 surnames, led the entire clan to resist but was defeated and captured. The Japanese brutally put Jing to death by boiling him in oil. 
On the brink of his extinction, Jing pulled two Japanese men into the oil pot. This event spread across Ryukyu and led to a change in its national emblem. Now, the Ryukyuan national emblem has a red circle in the middle, inside which are three black seas, symbolizing the scene of three people being fried to death in an oil pot, also expressing the Ryukyuan's commemoration of Zhen. The Ryukyuan capital, Shuri Castle, fell. The Satsuma Domain's invasion of Ryukyu changed the equal status between Japan and Ryukyu. This invasion placed Ryukyu under Japanese rule, where the Japanese army plundered the conquered kingdom of Ryukyu. The wealth Ryukyu accumulated through long-term foreign trade was ransacked as China was enforcing a maritime prohibition against Japan at this time, preventing average trade between China and Japan. To gain greater trade profits, Japan decided to use Ryukyu's special relationship with China to conduct business. Thus, the originally independent Ryukyu-China trade was also covertly controlled by Japan. In 1610, Shimazu Hisayoshi forced Sho Nei to pay homage to the Edo shogunate, and the second shogun, Tokugawa Hidetada, ordered Sho Nei to grant the Ryukyu tribute to Hisayoshi. Not depriving the king of Chusun was because the Tokugawa regime wanted to use Ryukyu to carry out peaceful negotiations with the Ming. To complete the reconciliation negotiations, Japan had to acknowledge the subordination relationship between Ryukyu and the Ming government at the time. However, while ostensibly pleasing the Ming, the Satsuma domain, with the shogunate's encouragement, had enacted ruling laws represented by the 15 Articles of Laws, intending to incorporate Ryukyu into the shogunate and domain system. In 1634, Tokugawa Emitsu, the third shogun of the Tokugawa shogunate, proclaimed the Shimazu clan, intending to assimilate the Ryukyu issue into Japan. The Shimazu clan, a powerful daimyo, was instructed to bestow land and stipends on Ryukyu officials, attempting to Japaneseize the Ryukyu matter. The Satsuma domain, Shimazu clan, changed the title of the Sho family from Nakayama king, Chusano to Ryukyu Kingdom, Ryukyu Kunishir. The title Ryukyu Kingdom first appeared in a letter written in 1615 by Shimazu Yahisa, addressing the governor of the Spanish colony of Luzon. That year, the Japanese side invented the title Ryukyu Kingdom to facilitate explaining Ryukyu's international status as a Satsuma domain vassal to the Spanish authorities. Japanese politicians, with shrewd calculations, sought to achieve their political objectives of annexing Ryukyu by using this strategy of linguistic ambiguity. This title also hinted at the intention of incorporating Ryukyu into the King Lord Governor Bakuhan system. As the Ming and Qing dynasties changed power, the positioning of Japan's relations with Ryukyu quietly transformed. In 1633, when Ryukyu welcomed Ming envoys for the inauguration, the Satsuma domain boldly speculated that the Ming government should have implicitly recognized Japan's control over Ryukyu, so we can consider presenting some gifts to the Ming envoys as a token of gratitude. However, when the Qing envoys visited Ryukyu in 1683, officials from the Satsuma domain claimed to be natives of the treasure island, Ryukyu and concealed their Japanese identity while dealing with the Qing envoys. This was because the Japanese feared friction with the Qing dynasty over control of Ryukyu. In the policy guidelines known as the Regulations for Travelers' Conduct, established by the Ryukyuan Royal Court in 1753, it was mentioned that if Qing people saw Japanese in Ryukyu, they were allowed to identify themselves as Ryukyu natives. This practice was commonly observed until the late Tokugawa period. However, in 1848, with the frequent visits of Western ships to Japan, there was a different response pattern in a document titled Answer to the Hearts of Foreigners, which stated, when Japanese ships interact with other ships, Western ships, and are asked about their origin, they should answer that they are ships from the Japanese treasure island. This indicates that during the transition from the early modern period to the contemporary era, concerning issues related to Ryukyu, 
Japan employed an asymmetric approach when dealing with China and the West. One reason was to ease the vigilance of the central Qing government, and the other was to demonstrate Japan's sovereignty over Ryukyu to the West. Japanese individuals resorted to hiding their identity to avoid conflicts with the Qing dynasty over control of Ryukyu. In the policy guidelines known as the Regulations for Travelers' Conduct, established by the Ryukyuan Royal Court in 1753, it was mentioned that if Qing people saw Japanese in Ryukyu, they were allowed to identify themselves as Ryukyu natives. This practice was commonly observed until the late Tokugawa period. However, in 1848, as Western ships began to frequently visit Japan, a different response pattern emerged in a document issued by the Japanese titled Response to Foreigners' Inquiries. It stated that Japanese ships, when interacting with other ships, Western ships, and being asked about their origin, should answer that they are ships from the Japanese Treasure Island. This indicates that during the transition from the early modern period to the modern era, Japan adopted an asymmetric approach concerning issues related to Ryukyu when dealing with China and the West. One reason was to ease the vigilance of the central Qing government, and the other was to assert Japan's sovereignty over Ryukyu to the Western powers. In 1853, Commodore Matthew Perry, the commander of the U.S. Pacific Fleet, led four black ships to Japan, forcing Japan to open its ports through force. This event significantly impacted Japan under the Tokugawa shogunate's rule. To guard against Perry's involvement in the Ryukyu issue, Abe Masahiro compiled a question-and-answer collection titled The Essentials of Dealing with the Ryukyu Issue. From this point onward, the Japanese began to worry that Western powers might intervene in the dual status of Ryukyu as both Chinese and Japanese. In 1854, Perry concluded the Treaty of Peace and Amity with Japan on the mainland at Uraga Harbor. He also completed the Treaty of Amity and Commerce with the Ryukyus in Naha, Okinawa. In terms of form and content, the former used both English and Japanese, along with Western calendar dates and Japanese-era names and was a treaty concluded between nations, the Treaty of Peace and Amity, with bilateral obligations. The latter, however, used both Chinese and English, along with Western calendar dates and Qing Dynasty-era names. It was not an equal agreement or treaty, articles of agreement, but a unilateral obligation. In this context, Ryukyu was more of a vassal state to China than part of Japan. Subsequent actions by several foreign powers, including France in 1855 and the Netherlands in 1859, confirmed this perspective, as they used the format of both Chinese and English, along with Western calendar dates and Qing Dynasty-era names in their treaties with Ryukyu. By this time, the Qing Empire, which had suffered heavy losses during the two Opium Wars, had lost its initiative in politics, economics, military affairs, diplomacy, and security on various levels. Internal strife was frequent, and it had no time to deal with border affairs, which provided Japan with an opportunity. In 1871, Japan implemented the abolition of the Han system and establishment of prefectures nationwide, treating Ryukyu as a ken, prefecture, and managed by Kagoshima Prefecture. In November of the same year, ships from the outlying islands of Ryukyu, including Miyako Island, traveled to the royal court in Shuri, Ryukyu, to pay annual tributes. However, these ships encountered a typhoon on their return journey and one ship drifted to Hanyao Bay in the southern tip of Taiwan, now within the territory of Pingdung County. The crew that went ashore was attacked by the indigenous people of Taiwan, killing 54 people. At the same time, another 12 managed to escape. They were taken in by Han Chinese residents and sent to Fuzhou's Ryuan Relay Station. In May 1873, Japan's Vice Foreign Minister Nakajima Nobyoshi raised the Hanyao Bay incident with the Qing government, lodging a protest and seeking compensation. The Qing government, having provided relief to the Ryukyuans, 
refused payment. Premier Yaman Minister Mao Changshi told Japanese envoys, the killers were all aboriginals, and they may be left outside civilization for the time being. It is not convenient to pursue the matter further. Japan seized upon this opportunity, since the Qing government recognized the eastern Taiwan mountain tribes as aboriginals, they were not subjects of the Qing government, and since it was not convenient to pursue the matter further, it was not an area the Qing government was governing. Therefore, Japan argued that its military actions against the aboriginals did not constitute an invasion of China. This served as a pretext for Japan's later invasion of Taiwan. In May 1872, Hirabumi Ito, an elder statesman of the Meiji government, submitted a memorial titled On the Handling of the Ryukyu Kingdom, proposing to clarify Ryukyu's status further. Subsequently, Ito coerced the Ryukyu king to come to Tokyo and demanded that Ryukyu quickly align its systems of setting up counties and paying taxes and tributes with those of mainland Japan. In handling the Ryukyu issue, the Meiji government not only used international colonialist rules represented by the law of nations as a reflection of the emerging international order but also leveraged the concept of the Sino-Barbarian hierarchy and the ceremonial system to choose the path of visualization. They first made Ryukyu appear in a dual subjection state, with the Ryukyu King Shotai receiving enfiefments from both China and Japan. After causing controversy, they gradually stripped its sovereignty using their superior strength. In June of the same year, the Japanese government unilaterally announced the abolition of the Ryukyu Kingdom. It renamed it the Ryukyu Domain, with Shotai appointed the Lord of the Ryukyu Domain. The establishment of the Ryukyu Domain, referred to by the Japanese as the first Ryukyu handling, was not only a trial by the Japanese government to promote its expansionist policies but also the first step in its efforts to infringe upon Asia. The success of this initial step paved the way for subsequent Japanese actions, including the invasion of Taiwan, military campaigns against Korea, and the First Sino-Japanese War, all aimed at expanding Japanese influence in Asia. The Qing government's outside-the-realm perspective encouraged calls within Japan to conquer Taiwan. After the Hanyao Bay incident, Osamu Okuyama, a counselor in Kagoshima Prefecture, proposed the Taiwan Expedition, urging the Meiji government to send troops to Taiwan to punish the aborigines. In May 1874, the Japanese government appointed Lt. Gen. Seigo Tsugumaki as the governor-general of Taiwan. It led 3,658 troops to Taiwan, claiming to punish the perpetrators. This pressured the Qing government and tested its concern regarding Taiwan and Ryukyu. Eager to quell the conflict, the Qing government, in the Beijing Articles of October 31st, which were signed with Japan, acknowledged that Japan's actions in this case were originally for the sake of protecting the people, and China does not deem it otherwise. At the same time, the Chinese side received Japan's promise that regarding Taiwan, China will do its best to reach an agreement. By recognizing Japan's actions as a protective measure for the people, the Qing government essentially acknowledged that the Ryukyuans were under Japanese control. To safeguard Taiwan, the Qing government began to realize Ryukyu's dual subjection status indicating a shift away from a strict suzerainty relationship and an intentional weakening of its sovereign claims over Ryukyu. After signing the Beijing Articles, Japan accelerated its efforts to annex Ryukyu. In May 1875, Japanese troops invaded Ryukyu, established colonial rule, prevented Ryukyu from paying tributes to China, and disrupted the coronation ceremony of Emperor Guangxu. During Japan's ongoing occupation plan, Ryukyu repeatedly sent envoys to China seeking assistance. In October 1876, King Shotai secretly dispatched envoys, including Shotoku Koziai, to China, beginning a lengthy campaign for rescue and survival. The following year, upon their arrival in Fuzhou, they presented a petition from the King of Ryukyu to the Chinese government, reporting Japan's attempts to annex Ryukyu. 
This information was immediately reported to the imperial court by Governor General He Jing of Fujian and Governor Ding Richang of Zhujiang, who also suggested that He Ruzhang, heading to Japan, negotiate directly with the Japanese regarding this issue. However, at this time, the Zibigu people in northwestern China were invading Xinjiang, and the court had no time to deal with Ryukyu, issuing only orders for Yi Ruzhang to negotiate with Japan. The court did not dispatch a single soldier to assist Ryukyu. To the Ryukyuan officials who came to present their case, the Qin court issued an edict instructing them to return home first. Hiruzhang followed orders and negotiated with Japan on the Ryukyu issue. He argued for Ryukyu's independent status and made efforts to preserve it. In a letter to Li Hongzhang on May 29, 1878, he expressed his views. First, from a geopolitical perspective, Ryukyu was crucial for Korea and Taiwan. Second, losing Ryukyu would endanger China's future border security. He proposed that Ryukyu should be contested. However, Li Hongzhang's response to the Ryukyu issue was dismissive in his letter to Yi Ruzhang. Ryukyu's tributary missions bring no significant benefit. If we were to exert power against a minor state's offerings, we would pursue empty fame and neglect far-reaching considerations. Not only is it unnecessary, but also pointless. In his view, handling the Ryukyu issue was about competing for tributes. In his opinion, Ryukyu was too distant from China, and there was no need to contend with Japan for it. Regarding the response to the Ryukyu crisis, he Ruzhang presented three strategies in a letter to the Grand Council of State. The first strategy was to send troops and ships, question Ryukyu, and force them to pay tributes to demonstrate to Japan that they would contest this issue. The second strategy was to present a clear argument, request Ryukyu to take joint action, and show Japan that they would assist Ryukyu. The third strategy was to engage in repeated debates and, if they did not comply, either invoke the law of nations to hold Japan accountable or involve foreign diplomats to mediate. However, Li Hongzhang felt that the first and second strategies seemed excessive and would only create confusion. On one hand, Li Hongzhang was pressured by the pro-Japan faction, and on the other hand, he wanted to avoid provoking Japan into military action. Therefore, he did not advocate an aggressive policy towards Japan and only emphasized using the third strategy. He believed the best approach was to repeat our arguments if they are not accepted. This approach could serve a dual purpose. Japan, being aware of the validity of China's position, might not rush to abolish the domains and change them into prefectures, allowing Ryukyu to protect itself. Furthermore, China would not need to send troops across the ocean. Ultimately, Li Hongzhang's advice was adopted by the Grand Council of State. When he did not have full support from the Qing government, He Ruzhang negotiated in Japan. On September 27, 1878, during a dialogue between He Ruzhang and Japan's Foreign Minister Terashima Muninori, Terashima stated, 300 years ago, we undertook the responsibility of governing Ryukyu. At that time, we appointed officials from Satsuma to manage Ryukyu's affairs. We also dispatched Japanese people to assist them in governance. Correspondingly, Ryukyu officials were sent to our mainland to consult on various administrative matters. Those who collect taxes on the land are its rulers, as seen in international public law and other documents. Although historical records mention that Ryukyu was a vassal state, we should evaluate the situation from the perspective of practical governance. Historical records are not sufficient evidence. The Meiji government was using the pretext of taxation as the basis for asserting sovereignty over Ryukyu, even declaring that historical records are not sufficient evidence. In the same dialogue, the Qing government briefly proposed involving Western countries. Terashima angrily responded, I am making this proposal entirely for the sake of your country. For 3,000 years, Ryukyu has been considered part of our nation. Furthermore, 
we have willingly allowed Ryukyu to be a vassal of your country. Morally speaking, we have given country enough face. In fact, Terashima's use of the terms considered part of our nation and vassal was a deliberate attempt to blur the distinction between these concepts. While a vassal state typically possessed independent sovereignty, the concept of being considered part of our nation was broader and more ambiguous. It could be interpreted differently in various contexts. Terashima conflated and reversed these two concepts in his speech, leaving He Ruzhang, who was unfamiliar with the logic of colonialism and the so called law of nations, unsure how to respond, ultimately believing that both considered part of our nation and vassal were elements of the territory concept as defined by the law of nations. In the unique context of that time, Japan's translation strategy indeed played a significant role in advancing its colonial policies. Some Japanese legal scholars continue to employ this logic and plan to deal with China's rise. 